ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's webcast entitled Romancing the C-Suite, How to Communicate PR and Marketing Value. Today's conversation is brought to you by AirPR and powered by OnStream Media. To submit a question or comment at any time during the webinar, please click on the Ask a Question button at the bottom of your screen. Simply type your message into the box and click on the Submit button. Alternatively, you can, you can submit your question at Twitter using the hashtag AskAirPR. All questions will be answered at the end of today's presentation. At this time, it is my pleasure to turn the floor over to today's host, Rebecca Eilis, Chief Strategy Officer for AirPR. AirPR is a technology company that enables data-driven brands and organizations to measure the impact of their PR efforts. Previously, she was the CEO of Talk Tech Communications, one of the fastest-growing tech PR firms in the country. She is currently a columnist for Mashable Inc., Forbes, Huffington Post, and an entrepreneur. Additionally, Rebecca frequently moderates and participates on panels at leading technology and businesses, business conferences, and she has presented at countless conferences on the future of PR and big data. She holds a BA in philosophy from Loyola University, Chicago, and an MA in organizational management and applied community psychology from Antioch University at Los Angeles. Rebecca, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Jen, and thank you for that very thorough introduction. I uh, wanted to say thank you to all of you who are joining us this morning. I do value your time. I know there's lots going on in the middle of the afternoon, so we appreciate you being here. Really quickly, just as a reminder, we are using the hashtag AskAirPR, so if any of you all have questions throughout, we'll try to get to some of those at the end. And then I think we did discuss yesterday staying on Twitter for about 30 minutes after the panel to answer any questions we may not have gotten to. So before I introduce our amazing panel of very diverse gentlemen who all have very different hair, um, we, uh, we are going to really quickly just give you the framework for today. So what we want you to take away from today is, number one, what the C-suite cares about, Number two, how to manage and communicate what really matters to them. As any of you know who are in communications, it's all about what you're communicating and what you're saying. And then number three, of course, the importance of measuring success and having benchmarks so that you can really showcase your value in a way that resonates with the C-suite. So to kick it off, I'm going to introduce our panelists. I'm going to start with David Berkowitz. David is currently the CMO of MRY where he spearheads marketing operations and works with the agency on communication strategy. His clients include everyone from Coca-Cola to Visa and Johnson & Johnson. So as you can imagine, he is working with CEOs and CMOs regularly. He is well-known on speaker circuit globally. He's spoken at everything from South by Southwest to Digital Age 2.0 Brazil, Crowdsourcing Week in Singapore. So he's, you know, world traveler, and I'm sure many of you follow him on Twitter and know who he is. Uh, his writing has appeared in everything from The Economist to Ad Age to Mashable. So, David, thank you for joining us. Glad to have you here today. Thanks for having me. Next, uh, Michael Newworth is currently the Senior Director of PR for Dannon, where he directs corporate communications and also handles their crisis communications. He's held agency positions at Porto Novelli and Ruder Finn. And a fun little tidbit about Michael as well, he, uh, he is very entrepreneurial. He actually started an organic food company where he raised venture capital and clearly worked with the C-suite in terms of romancing them to give him money, among other things, I'm sure. So um, Michael has a great background, both from the PR side and then also really communicating with various constituents from venture capitalists to, to C-suite to other communicators. And then last but certainly not least, Mark Seuss, currently the founder and CEO of Proof, which is a software services startup in the marketing communication space. He's founded several companies. He was the global VP of Honeywell, and he's worked with hundreds of CMOs and CEOs to really help them understand and harness big data and analytics. So he brings a, a very unique perspective in terms of the analytics side, and we're so happy to have him here. So, Mark, thanks for joining us as well. You bet. And before we kick it off, um, for those of you that may be joining late, you are getting – this is probably the best part of the whole 
the whole panel. So I told the guys that I was going to ask them before we start because of the, the subject matter. Um, I want to know, and I'm sure the audience wants to know, what is the most romantic thing that you've ever done? So we're going to start. Mark, I'll have you kick it off, actually. You, were, you gave us a little sneak preview. Uh, so, so, so tell, tell us, tell us what, that, what that was. Well, so I've been married for uh, 16 years, um, and when I took my wife uh, on our honeymoon, uh, we went skiing in Whistler over Christmas, um, and I called the hotel ahead of time and had them put a large, fully decorated, and fully lit Christmas tree in our room. Um, and uh, not only did that, you know, really please my wife, but uh, it was uh, our hotel was right there facing the mountain in Whistler, and the hotel, you know, most of the rooms would be dark, right? But you could see the Christmas tree from the mountain. And so it was quite the topic of conversation, I think, uh, on the mountain from time to time, just based on different conversations that I ever heard. So it was just a lot of fun. Yeah. It was cool. Yeah, that's uh, – I'm not sure anyone's going to be able to top that, but that, that is – on a scale of 1 to 10, I think that's like a 9.8. I'm very impressed. Okay. You set the, you set the bar really high. Um, D- David, David, what, what you got? <laughs> oh, well, even if I can't score 9.8, I hope I at least uh, don't get disqualified from the so, uh, uh So when I proposed to my wife, uh, I, mean, there, I had a few trips up my sleeve when, when we flew down to uh, Puerto Morelos, just south of Cancun, and, and so kind of had a secret spot. My wife didn't quite know the proposal was happening. It was beautiful. It happened to be deserted, stretched beach on a moonlit night, so couldn't have planned that better. But the one thing that was really over the top that, uh, uh, uh that, uh, gave her a taste of the romantic life of being married to me was <laughs> that, uh, that she didn't know that on our, our, our trip back, I had arranged for us to fly through Dallas to see her parents and stay there a couple of days on the way so so she could spend a little time with them and, and celebrate together. And I, I even booked it under a total separate reservation because I knew that she would be like, trying to manage our reservation and stuff. So she had no clue that was coming, and it was a, a pretty nice surprise for her and, and for her parents. That's pretty sweet. Uh, Mark, I think he just gave you a run for his money. And for any yep. single Absolutely. single pe- people, I guess men or women in the audience, um, clearly the most romantic thing that you'll ever get from your future husband is during the proposal process. So um, just just <laughs> words and wise for anyone anyone that's out there. Um, it's all downhill after that. Uh, Michael, oh, what about I'm going to tr- I'm going to try to kick over your apple cart, Rebecca, okay. because okay. Uh, this may not be the most <laughs> romantic thing I've done, but it's the most recent romantic thing I've done. My wife and I've been married for uh, just over 13 years, and uh, last week uh, we were in Venice and took her on a surprise gondola ride, um, which uh, you know was a wonderful way not only to see the city but but uh, ensure that she was close in my arms uh, in that narrow little boat seeing uh one of the most beautiful cities in the world so um Aww. wow wow yeah, that's, that's, that's awesome. a good i don't know i don't know we may have to take a poll at the end to see who had the most romantic <laughs> story but i'm i'm very impressed and i'm also really happy that in addition to being amazing executives you guys are also seemingly really sweet and romantic so that's good um so now we're gonna we're gonna see if, if those romantic skills translate to uh, your experience with, with the C-suite and with the executives. So, again, for those of you who didn't hear the beginning, what we're talking about today, what, what does the C-suite actually care about in terms of marketing communications value? How can you manage that communications about um, what matters? And then, last but certainly not least, the importance of measuring success and having benchmarks. And it's those things that we're going to talk about today. So, uh, to kick it off, we are going to set the tone really quickly with this great quote. And really, this is just for everyone who's listening in. I think that with all of the talk now about data and analytics and measurement, which are all very important, it's also good to take a moment to understand how truly valuable it is to have creativity in the workplace. So if we didn't have, you know, your creative work and storytelling and communication skills, um, 
there really wouldn't be anything to report on. And furthermore, this is one of the most important leadership competencies um, for the future. And so just to kind of um, pat yourselves on the back and, and really, you know, understand that what you're doing is so valuable to an organization and public relations and marketing is often the lifeblood of how you communicate um, to the market at large. So it is a really important thing to understand uh, your own value before we jump into everything else. So now we're going to, we're going to turn it over to the panel and really start with this question, which is how do we showcase this creativity that's so important in a language and a process that our CEO or whomever we're reporting to, for that matter, can appreciate and, and can understand? Um, and so I'm going to start with Mark. Um, the question is, you know, why do you think it's so difficult for communicators to keep it simple? Yeah, that's actually a great question. Um, I think that, that a lot of communicators are people with a great sense of nuance. Um, and they, and they, what that means in a lot of cases is that they tend to glory in the complexity of details. Um, and they do that for different reasons. I think sometimes it makes, it's because the, uh, the more complex seems more important than the simple. Um, I think you know, a lot of marketers struggle with the same issue, particularly in industries that are technical or scientific. Um, and so the net is, I think a lot of times, is that complexity equals credibility to many marketers and communicators, regardless of what they know to be true about keeping things simple. So this is where what they would advise a client to do is not necessarily what they do themselves. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. And I think, David, you mentioned, you talked about this a little bit, but, um, you know, what are the most common mistakes communicators make? Mark alluded to it, but what are those mistakes that communicators make that, you know, make them quickly lose that credibility? Uh, I, I think so much of it just, boils down to this lack of empathy and you know, just trying to get in the other person's shoes and really understand it's like you know what kind of day are they having uh, uh, what are the main mm-hmm. things that they that uh, that they're going to care about right now and and how are you going to be providing value to their day and I mean even with us right here all of us especially if we want to be invited back to one of these things we have to think well like how are we going to respect the time of uh, everyone who's sitting through their you know, lunch or coffee hour to join us today. And, and this is just such a critical thing. And, and, and so a lot of it means getting to the point, which is why I'll wrap this answer now. That, that was a great segue. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, Michael, to that point, any tips from your experience on how to quickly grab attention? So email format, catchy subject lines, what really gets your execs going, so to speak? Yeah, well, before I answer that, I just want to pick up on what David said because I think communicators often um, think of uh, think of that role as <clears throat> presenter when a great communicator is twice as good a listener as they are a presenter. Mm-hmm. And so I think, you know, I really respect David's answer on that. Um, in terms of grabbing attention quickly, I think the in my experience, uh, some C-suite senior leaders can be very insulated with um, less than ideal exposure to the outside world, uh, as well as internally among their own employees, um, one or two levels removed. So I think the most important thing I've seen is to help them understand that communications, both internally and externally, have to be relevant in the context of the audiences. What are their what are their audiences internally and or externally? What's their background? And so I think the best way to quickly grab the attention of uh, of the C-suite is to ask them why does this matter and what is the desired outcome, so that they are always reminded of the context of the audiences that they want to impact. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I I definitely believe that we often forget to just ask that simple question. What, you know, do you, I mean, it's just like with any relationship. Do you like phone calls, text, email? What's your preferred method of communication? 
You know, I, I think that it's sometimes as simple as that. Um, and if they don't know, then you can kind of, you know, a lot of times they'll say, well, I don't, I don't know. I'll know when I see it. But I think we should at least be asking the question. Um, before Rebecca, we move on to, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, can I add one thing? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, th- I think from the CEO point of view or the, 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 let's call it the business leader point of view, uh, and this goes uh, to, to the strength of, of that comment about being isolated, they are often playing a constant game of who do I trust, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so they're constantly, they're not just evaluating your message per se, but also can I depend on this person? Do they understand what the real situation is, what the real equation is? And so I think one of the big mistakes that people make uh, in, in the marketing and communication space is that they speak the language of creativity to the business leader when, in most cases, the business leader wants informed creativity. They need to be, to be able, to, yeah. They need to be able to speak about creativity in the language of business because that's what buys them the credibility and makes the business leader want to listen to them. Yeah, I could not agree more. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Just what that framework actually looks like. I want to shift focus now a little bit just to give everyone an understanding of really like what it used to look like versus what it looks like now and why everything is so data focused. Um, At AirPR, we really talk to customers uh, in terms of this particular content framework, which is, you know, we're looking at things not anymore in terms of editorial, um, but we're looking at it in terms of channels. So you you have your New York Times, for example, which is your earned media channel. You have your company blog, which is owned media, and then the Newswire service. So these are the channels that you're looking at in order to communicate whatever it is you're trying to communicate to your constituents. The second aspect of this framework is around format. So is it written? Is it in text format? And I'm I'm speaking mainly here in a digital environment. Uh, Then you have things like video and audio or visuals. So then the second thing that we really need to decide as communicators is how do we best format what we're trying to say and so that it resonates with whomever we're trying to reach. And then, of course, lastly, but I would say most importantly, is the measurement side. So analytics, insights, and benchmarking. And when you look at PR particularly and communications and marketing as well, with this framework, what, you, what it really does is it reverse engineers the way you're thinking about reporting to the C-suite. Because when you do it like this, you actually have a very succinct kind of output that you can put into, again, more a definitive, um, informed, creative report to give to your C-suite. So, Michael, I want to I wanna turn this over to you and talk about, um, and you may or may not agree with this. I mean, this is I'm perfectly open for discussion. It's certainly how we think about it uh, is from the technology standpoint. But if this is the new content framework for communicators, uh, how does it affect how we communicate value? So talk about the old days a little bit. What did you used to report? How did we used to think about PR and journalism versus now? Well, you know, back in the old days when phones had cords and TVs weren't flat and we used maps instead of GPS, um, we used to think of media simply as relayers. I, I agree with your your um, your view of the world today, Rebecca. Um, and so we and we would relay we would provide a message to a relayer and then we would uh we would see what was the total reach of via that relayer and that is extremely outdated as you point out and a very dangerous assumption today um that i still see many pr professionals making they're they're talking about total reach numbers which uh frankly is uh i don't care about um so historically, we talk about media impressions and reach, and today, I think you know the art of influence is a lot more complicated and in many ways more delicate um, and that provides an opportunity for communicators to use uh, perhaps a small well placed news item or an opinion story that can have a tremendous impact um, as what was used to be considered a big story in the New York Times. 
if that small, well-placed news item or opinion story, if it catches fire, if it gets amplified in the right way. So I think that's really the question is not what's the scale, the size of, of the platform, but does it have the right thematic, does it have the right um, uh, ingredients to catch fire? Yeah, and we have some really interesting case studies around that because we have, you know, data from these huge companies that we're working with, and it is exactly what you say. It's really about a lot of times these nuanced channels and publications that are driving the most potential customers and the most engagement on site. It's not necessarily the big sweeping stories in the Wall Street Journal and New York Times, although those are still very important from a, from a brand equity and brand awareness standpoint. But, um, David, talk a little bit about your thoughts on this. Expand on, on Michael's point, if you can. Uh, yeah, sure. I, I mean, I, I think the one thing that we still have to make sure to keep in mind is where the audience fits in with this. And, and so it's like, yeah, it, with any of these frameworks, even the best ones, uh, they can be used really well or they can be used really poorly and they can you know, be used to justify uh, poor decisions. So it's like, mm-hmm. uh, uh, so making sure that you have this appreciation for where it fits in with the broader planning is is really key, and and that it's not just all uh, about the channels and formats, which is often you know what grabs a marketer's eye, especially in the context of creativity. Um, right. But figuring out uh, all this in the context of who the audience is, when and how you want to reach them. Uh, and, and how they're using these channels because uh, 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 two people can be using the same channel or, or interacting with the same kind of uh, format uh, very, very differently. Uh, and so appreciating some of the nuance is still really critical once you understand this framework. Yeah, and Mark, before we jump into, because I want you to give us a specific example because I feel like you probably have a couple of good ones. Um, I just want to get... You know, Michael, maybe this is a good question for you, but, you know, when people ask you why not impressions, why not AVEs, why not reach, why not share a voice, what's your response? Because I think that's what we're seeing. People are still really stuck in these old ways of thinking and because, you know, you can't map it to to business value. So what is your response? Uh, my response to AVEs is that um, the value of AVEs is, is, is poorly understood, in my opinion, and so that, that's a bad framework to start with. And, but shifting to impressions total, um, there, there is a value to an impression. You know, a great story that's not told so it has no impressions is meaningless. Um, but a great story that's told to somebody who is going to in turn relay it to others is – is, is it has immeasurable value. So I think it's really about, it's more about the quality of, of an impression than the absolute number of all impressions. And that's my answer to it. And, um, I mean, it's, I, I, I think it, it, it's not, you know, it's like, uh, going back to our discussion of romantic stories. It's not, it's not how often you're romantic. It's how meaningful is the romance. Right. Well, we can argue about this offline, but <laughs> I, happen to, I, happen, I happen to completely disagree with you, but that's okay. We won't get into it now. Um, we, can do, we can do it over Twitter because then I don't actually have to talk to you about it. I can just tweet you about it. Um, so, Mark, give us a specific example of a successful campaign from when you were at Honeywell. Well, you know, Honeywell's challenge, and I was, uh, I was the CMO, CCO of Aerospace uh, at Honeywell, um, was not really around reaching more people to do business with because they were already doing business with everybody who mattered in aerospace. It was really about doing more business, so the expanding the share of wallet, and also the whole issue of sales velocity, being able to close deals faster. It's important to say that one of the unique aspects of both marketing and communications in contrast to sales, is that both of these, meaning marketing and comms, deal with the market at scale. And so they have a unique opportunity to drive a pervasive change in belief and behavior that then directly influences sales productivity. Mm -hmm. So we organize.
organized it that way at Honeywell. We had three major kinds of campaigns. We had revenue campaigns, we had margin campaigns, and we had cash flow campaigns. And these were all about focusing on this idea of awareness, confidence, and trust as being the makeup of a brand from the customer's point of view, right? Mm -hmm. So we were really focusing on the last two. We were trying to build confidence that Honeywell could not only just sell you a few things, but could sell you a complete solution to a really big problem. And so that drove a lot of deal expansion uh, on a pervasive basis uh, in the company. And we could track all that and see all that, and we could run the cause and effect analysis on that and prove it to the satisfaction of the company and the leaders. And then we also picked up about a you know, 5% improvement in velocity on a pervasive mm-hmm. basis, which when you're talking about a 12 or $13 billion a year company, is a lot of additional cash per quarter um, coming in from the positive side of cash flow, not just controlling costs on the other side of cash flow. So these were really big home runs uh, at Honeywell that illustrate the end-to-end cause and effect of what we all have done or are doing for a living in marketing and communications. Right, that this idea that we are doing what we're doing because we believe it has a cause and effect relationship, even whether that is tactically, operationally, or strategically, that ultimately it's there because, and we're doing it because it has that impact, is crucial. Proving it is even more important. And so the, I loved what you said, Rebecca, about reverse engineering because That is the essence of what we were doing. We were starting with the business goals, and then we were saying, okay, what do we need to do as a marketing and communications team to drive those goals? Yeah, and Mark, I've heard you talk a lot about cause and effect, and, of course, when we met in person in San Francisco and you were talking a little bit about what you're working on, I think that this is one of the, the main issues with communications and marketing is because it's very difficult to show the cause and effect relationship and to correlate that and to give attribution to the, the work that is done. And so I think that obviously technology can play a huge role in this, and um, I think we're making great strides as a P, the PR technology kind of ecosystem in being able to do that. But I think just for those of you that are listening, this is a really important kind of takeaway in terms of, you know, the best way – to, that you're going to be able to communicate value and showcase value is if you ha- if you get closer to showing that cause and effect relationship. And it's not just about, oh, we got a hit in the New York Times or, oh, we right. got, you know, so-and-so celebrity tweeted about us. That's great, but that's just the start of the conversation. That's just, that's just kind of the content, so to speak, that you can then use to really drive some sort of business objective. So, but you know the, um, the the cool the cool piece, Rebecca, about this having crunched a lot of companies' data, is that marketing and comms have a much better story to tell about business value creation than they have ever dreamed. And mm-hmm. to the extent that that is true for marketing, it is trebly true for comms, because mm-hmm. marketing is primarily around awareness and lead gen, but comms is mid and late stage decision impact. It is influence. And so the, the, this is, this is the, the big message here. If you're afraid at all or concerned or kind of freaked out about what this is going to show about what you're doing, don't be. You have a great story to tell in most cases. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. Um, and, you know, having said that, I think that what's important, too, is this dot connecting. So what we're really talking about is how do our creative ideas or these inputs ultimately convey messages that we want, reach the audience we want, give us useful information about our brand, generate top-of-the-funnel business leads? You know, communications and, and PR is really good at that, um, and we're not able to showcase that oftentimes. And then ultimately, how does all of this map to business goals? So, Michael, um, we, we had talked briefly about, you know, Dannon and how – you know, you're connecting the dots between the messages that go out and then what success 
looks like. So for, for a huge company and a huge brand, uh, what is the strategy and process and how do you ensure that these creative ideas are having some level of impact? What do you do, what do, you do to ensure that? Mm. Um, well, there's a lot we do. We're, we're, I mean, I'll begin, I guess, probably the best way to address it is with a specific example. And um, uh, we are the market leader in yogurt by a large margin. Uh, and um, so we, we do a lot in terms of growing the category, getting people to, to think about and, and eat yogurt in general more um, than, than other uh, food choices. And so one of the things we, we look at is we first we want to, in, to get people to consume more yogurt, and uh, we're looking at it primarily through a policy, or not primarily, but, but one, the example I'll share is the policy side um, and getting healthcare professionals, government, and others to recommend eating yogurt. And we begin by analyzing who is it we want to influence and then measuring various outcomes against that defined group, whether it's academics, government, or healthcare professionals. Um, and so one example of, of what we've done is, um, while this is not a particularly large group, uh, healthcare professionals and, and, and uh, uh, food policy uh, government folks, it's a very influential one. Um, so we've created a, a suite of, of activities Symposia, uh, Twitter handle, which is Yogurt Every Day, at Yogurt Every Day. Um, and we've invited a very focused group to join a conversation about better for you snacks and foods um, based on their interests in public health and the health outcomes that are related to diets that, not surprisingly, include yogurt. Um, and so we, we're looking at things like how, how, how engaged are they in these conversations? Um, how are the topics that are interest to us um, uh, mapping with with topics that they're promoting um, and trying to find as many intersections uh, and connections between them so that we are effect so that we're changing the quality and the and the frequency of conversations and the role of yogurt in those conversations and it's been extremely effective um, if you've seen the two thousand and fifteen dietary guidelines. Which, uh, which now promote yogurt and equal footing to milk, um, whereas historically it had been a three-way discussion between milk, cheese, and yogurt. So, you know, we, we measure things in very specific ways is, I guess, what I would summarize by saying. Well, it worked on me because I do eat yogurt every day. So, and we actually have a stash of Dan and yogurt in our refrigerator at Air PR, so... There you go. I mean, it worked. So, <laughs> so it's working. Good to hear. Um, so, David, can you give me an example? I mean, it's great to hear success stories, but you know, you've you've seen everything. So you've seen it work. You've seen it not work. Can you give the audience an example of a flop and and maybe something that didn't work so well? It, yeah. Well, it's it's definitely a great when you have a company like that and poised to take advantage of cultural trends that work in their favor and and. Uh, I know, especially ever since uh, my kid was born a couple of years ago, I've been eating a lot more dairy and a lot more yogurt. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so, so I've been following her to lead, let alone a lot more mac and cheese. It's like almost a reason to have kids. <laughs> so, I could make this for dinner every night. It's, it's the best. Um, uh, but uh, but there there are some brands who go against the cultural moment, and and it's been really interesting in, in the past several months and. And maybe something I'm all the more attuned to, having a, a daughter now, uh, it, it's just that uh, that marketers really seem to keep messing up uh, women's empowerment, which is kind of funny because like you think this is actually like fairly easy to get, but uh, I'm apparently wrong. Uh, and so, uh, so you had IBM trying to celebrate female engineers, and then they do this whole. Hack a hair dryer event. <laughs> it's like, I mean, <laughs> how on earth did this get approved, right? Like, like why yeah. can't the women be, you know, building the next Tesla or supercomputer or something like that? No, they have to hack a hair dryer or, or, right. or you know, or 
BIC, which actually has a line of women's pens that, and they've been lambasted for in the past. Uh, their uh, you know, pens mm-hmm. for women became a meme on the internet for a while. Uh, but then they actually uh, told women uh, through social media to, uh, on Women's Day to think like the man. And, mm. and, uh, wow. and it's just, how do you miss it so horribly? And, and you know, the funny thing is that there are uh, uh, other you know, uh, cultural issues that have gone on, uh, like uh, around marriage equality, where brands have been uh, pretty progressive and, and actually willing to embrace issues. And, and even actually, if, if they haven't taken a stance in favor of marriage equality, that they uh, had a, a more civil defense of, uh, 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 why this just isn't one of the company's values, but it it it, it wasn't just so outright tone deaf and offensive. And, and there's something about just understanding women that, that it just be so off the mark, and it, and it's happening over and over again. Well, I'm just glad we've got you on the record saying that a company insinuating that a woman should think like a man is a big mistake because I couldn't <laughs> agree more. Um, just kidding, you guys. I love you guys, you know. Um, so, so, Mar- so, Mark, uh, to kind of wrap up this concept of connecting the dots, how do you manage these expectations? I mean, how do you, uh, of executives, how do you, you know, what they really care about, how do you, how do you manage that process? Well, I think the most important thing to do here is to start with the business goals, right, and get agreement and real understanding on what the executives expect because they are spending money on marketing and communications, not because they think that marketing and communications are just innately great. They expect a business outcome. That Mm -hmm. can be sales impact. It can also be the ability to recruit better people uh, faster, into the ranks than they otherwise could. I mean, this is, a, this is really what they're really saying is, I have these goals, marketing and communications, you own the, the, the brand or you're the custodians of the brand. How are we going to leverage our brand power, right, into these business goals? Hmm. And then I think you have to be very, very specific about what that looks like, right? Um, Again, I think that the upshot of brand power in those kinds of equations, and I'm going to use sales as the easy example, is that it allows you to sell to more people, sell more to more people, and do both of those things faster and more efficiently. If you have low brand power, you won't get that. If you have high brand power, you will. And so I think that being able to deconstruct the chain – of cause and effect is ultimately how you do this. I think that this is one of the reasons why marketing and comms as professions are still stuck on this issue in spite of having unprecedented levels of data to work with. They still are not proving the case uh, to the business leader. They're not connecting the the dots to the business leader in the way that the business leader sees as credible. And so I think that that is really the nut of the whole thing, and that's exactly what proof is all about. That's exactly what we do is we connect the dots. Yeah, and I think we're doing a lot of that too, which which I believe in within the next five years is, you know, this whole concept of cause and effect will be widely adopted and people just won't be able to get away with without having it, without showing some sort of data around that. Um, before we jump into the Q&A, I want to get tactical for a minute and – you know, share these ideas with the audience in terms of communicating value to decision makers. This was a great quote uh, from one of our customers when we were you know, first starting to work with them, and I think, you know, it's so true. It's just give me, give me the data, give me the top five things that I need that I need to know, but give, give it to me in a data-driven way. So, um, Michael, what are some key metrics that you know you're communicating to decision makers? How are you doing that at Dannon? Mm. Um, well, I talked earlier a little bit about um, the importance of quality versus quantity, and I'll, I'll, I'll bring that message back again. We are much more focused on the quality of the conversations than the quantity of the reach um, because we use PR uh, comms for credibility first and visibility second. 
and we're very conscious and open about that. And so we begin first by making our senior leadership, the C-suite, very well aware of the profiles, like the people of who we need to influence and the organizations that are either with us or against us um, or somewhere in the middle, um, and how we want to influence and move them in, in a direction that, that supports uh, our, our vision of growth and, and better health for Americans. Um, and so within our halls, if you walk down to area of our company where, where our senior leadership uh, sits, they are well known, and those names, our profiles, are, are, they are, they're well known. That's, that's what we're measuring. Um, and so we're assessing progress on a qualitative basis with mm. individuals and organizations, and there are some quantitative. I'm not going to say quantitative doesn't matter, but it is, it is, if, it's, if it's close, it, but it's clearly a distant second for us. So you're saying quantitative, from qualitative versus quantitative, yep. you put more emphasis on qualitative? Absolutely. Is that what I'm hearing? Absolutely. Really? So, okay. for example, if we have a uh, uh, someone who's critical of a business practice uh, that that or something we're doing, um, we're measuring how do we change that person's perspective? How do we change that out? How do we how do we affect? How do we influence um, that perspective? And um, that can be through media, it can be through direct, it can be through symposia, it can be through any number of tools with our influence. Um, and, and, but, but it's a qualitative assessment, um, much more so than a quantitative. The quantitative is how we get, the quantitative is the tactical piece for us. The qualitative gotcha. is the strategic piece. Yeah, that makes sense. I just wanted to clarify because it, it, I would imagine that you just have you know, you're pulling through so much data, you, you know, it's got to be structured and aggregated to a certain degree, but you couldn't just have the qualitative, otherwise you wouldn't be able to get, you, know, you can't get that without the data. Okay. That's and then David, David, um, how do you showcase success month over month for your, I mean, you, you represent huge companies, so what are you guys doing and how do we, you know, help us understand um, what your executives are looking for? Uh, well, I think uh, a lot of it, it is that regardless of, of what metrics we show, context is everything. Uh, mm. and, and, and I, I know there are also some uh, questions coming in about the balance of paid owned and earned media. And so, uh, a, a lot, of, uh, I mean, one of the biggest problems with uh, with quantitative metrics, uh, to the points we're just hearing, is, is that they can be influenced so heavily by paid media, and so uh, so and and often we see this from competitors, right? Like all of a sudden, a, a competitor seems to have a much bigger presence, and and, and uh, they're really out there. Well, they, uh, I, I mean, perhaps they're putting a lot of ad dollars behind it. We were, uh, I, I was analyzing something for my holding company at one point because it looked like a, a rival holding company all of a sudden was ballooning in their Twitter activity around some event. And it turns out that, that they had a number of, uh, of very you know, low follower uh, Twitter accounts in individual markets that were then sharing a lot of stuff more frequently around some event. Um, but, but, but those shares weren't generating much engagement that, uh, you know, they, and they weren't, they, they seemed to just be adding to the overall volume metric. And, and so I just, uh, love looking, I, I, I agree with looking at the impact of what you're doing over just the sheer metrics. And I, I think there, there are also some things that like, yeah, are there key goals and, and milestones you're trying to hit? So, you know, uh, uh, turning around a critic, I, I, I think, is a fantastic one. Uh, another thing that's been really important on my own teams has been trying to spread the wealth around a, a lot. Like, yeah, I've worked with the chief strategy officer who's been nowhere near as visible as he should be given all the experience he has in the industry. So, uh, so well, like for me to get another speaking engagement, it helps the company's visibility for sure, but for him to get a keynote slot, it really ups Everything he can do, it makes uh, it easier for him to hire people on his team. It gives him more access to uh, more opportunities for thought leadership. So there's 
a much higher upside to that, and and I think those kinds of wins need to be celebrated more. Yeah, I, I agree. It's you know, it's the art and science piece that we always talk about. I mean, <laughs> you need both. It's like if you're just looking at the data, you're going to miss things that are going on um, anecdotally. So I think it is important to to kind of do it all and then figure out to the best of our ability. Um, using data and analytics to figure out how we optimize and maximize success. Um, there's a question that, Mark, I was going to ask you about, you know, see, when you see reports from a PR team, what are your immediate thoughts? But there's a question from the audience, uh, which I think ties in nicely, where, you know, she's asking, any suggestions for handling a less than successful C-suite report um, in a way that translates to ra- rationale for higher budget allocation? So I think what she's saying is, you know, how do you I, – I personally believe that most of the time when a CMO sees a PR report that's 90 pages long and talks about 7 billion impressions – sorry, Michael, I know you love impressions, but 7 billion <laughs> impressions, you know, so basically everyone on the planet saw your press release, which is virtually impossible, um, they throw it in the trash. And this goes back to what we were talking about before in terms of credibility. You don't have trust and you don't have credibility if what you're that's reporting right. seems inane. So, uh, Mark, maybe answer that question briefly. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think that the the challenge here, right, is you you've got a situation where you're using terms, and let's take impressions for a second, right? And you're using them to say that so many eyeballs saw my stuff, saw the company stuff. Except that's not what an impression is. That's not the technical definition of one. An impression is the opportunity to be seen, right? Mm-hmm. So when, when you get that, con- and, and a lot of executives know this, right? So when they see you lead with this, they're like, oh, my God, right? I know more about what the, what the truth of this is than this person does, right? And they're in PR or in advertising. So, so that right there, you cut yourself off at the knees if you do that with most business leaders, I think that the that the real issue here, if you want to drive more investment, is to show people, show the business that you understand their business drivers, right? You understand how they make their money, what their challenges are to making money, and how you can bring marketing or PR or some other discipline that's in the same bucket to bear on that, right? and where you're no longer reporting out marketing and communications metrics as terminal metrics. You've got to be able to put them in the context of what does this mean for the business. So, for example, I thought that what Michael was talking about, about the way that they converted what had been a three-horse race um, with cheese and milk into a two-horse race with milk, is actually a fascinating and an awesome illustration of something that is probably going to deliver a significant market share gain to Dannon, right? I mean, I would be shocked if that were not the case. And so that is the kind of equation you've got to lead with. If you just say, man, we had unprecedented amount of coverage in these publications and outlets over the last quarter, Everyone's going to say, wow, that's so cool, particularly if you did it for less money, right? They're going to go, awesome stewardship, right? Awesome performance. But if you can't say what it means to the business in terms of what they're trying to accomplish, you will always be treated as a cost center and not a part of the business, not a business engine, which in point of fact is what you are. You are a business engine. Yeah, and I think we, we at AirPR, we talk about this in terms of what you're talking about is this concept of share of voice, and then we kind of take it one step further and talk about this concept of power of voice, which basically means what's having impact, what's relevant, what's, what's pushing you further down that funnel to someone making a buying decision. Because ultimately, if PR right. communications isn't doing something to get the customer down the funnel, then we've missed. Um, on no, you know, on a variety of levels, but it's not just like the quantity. It's the it's the impact. It's you know how you really take whatever you're communicating and figure out um, 
again, how it's getting the customer closer to making that buying decision. Um, this is a really That's interesting true. question. Maybe I will direct this um, to David. Is it possible, in your opinion, to over-communicate via social networks? I happen to think so. <laughs> but, I mean, what, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, social media is such a beast at this point. You know, it's so funny because just today I was updating my contact field with uh, someone I ran into a little bit ago, and I actually had a, a note about how much this person overshared when uh, I met with them. And this just happened to be in person, but uh, but it's like I mean, it's possible to over communicate in every channel, and it was egregious enough. I I had notes on what he was oversharing about. I'm like, oh, that guy. Uh, and, and so. Uh, yeah, I, and, and I do keep maybe more meticulous notes than others, but uh, but absolutely, and especially when you're talking about romance in the C-suite, it's like, I, I, I mean, there, there are just so many people who, who don't seem to respect the time people have, and it's like, like you know, for instance, when the, the phone rings at you know, 5 o'clock, it's some salesperson who has that playbook, say, like, Saying like this is the best time to reach out to someone in this position, and uh, and maybe their admin went home. No, I've never had one, but uh, that uh, and so you can reach them directly now. And it's like just and it's just following some textbook instead of trying to connect with another human being. And it's like just again, it goes back to reaching out to people in in a way that you want to be reached out to. Yeah, and I think that brands oftentimes make the mistake of using social as an opportunity to just talk about themselves and even though it's really supposed to be conversational and so I think we have to be careful about ensuring that we're using it as an opportunity to educate and entertain and engage and not just say hey I have a new product launch hey I'm doing this hey I'm doing that look at me it's you know it's just like walking I I talk about this in terms of that annoying guy at a party who is just talking about himself constant or girl just talking about themselves and you and you're just like what where's the conversation here you know it's someone just spewing information at you is not the best way to build rapport or a relationship. So, again, it goes back to this is, this is a relational, uh, I would say, skill, uh, what PR and communicators are doing. This is, this is interesting, and I, I want to try to get as granular. We only have about three minutes left, but um, Katie fully posed this great question. Um, what are the specific key data points or metrics, she says, I feel like we as communicators talk about this question constantly. Um, it is largely a matter of what you're trying to do, but, you know, do any of you have thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah, actually, there's a lot. I mean, it would be a, it's a really exhaustive question, right? So I'm going to try and, and give you a simple version, but it's a big answer. Um, there's a lot, there's the, typically companies that are trying to look at this have access to somewhere between 500 and 1200 data sets that they're trying to use to deal with this. Um, based on our research uh, and, and the analysis we've done, easily 25% of those are redundant or otherwise not relevant. So you can you can really collapse this down to about three or four hundred key data sets if you're trying to show the entire daisy chain of cause and effect from your tactical action all the way to business outcome. Um, the most important part of it, though, is being able to do you know a time shift because these things don't happen instantaneously. Particularly in PR, the effect can be six, seven, 12 months later in many cases in terms of impact on the deal uh, or on the business. So it's a really big question with a really big answer. Um, mm -hmm. But the, the bottom line is, is that um, a lot of the data that is being used right now is not relevant. I couldn't agree more. I think probably 70 to 80 percent of it if I was to guess. Uh, Michael, do you have thoughts on that, just from the Danon perspective? Yeah, I, you know, it's, it's um, when I look at social media, I think, okay, this is the place where we listen first, and then we talk Amen. later. 
And um, because it's, it, it is, it's like uh, it's in, it began as an extension of a consumer care line, right? Someone's going to pick up the phone or write to you to tell you you have a problem. So the first thing you have to do in that is, is listen and then respond appropriately and not over-respond um, and be a gracious host. And, um, and that doesn't mean dominating the conversation. Right. And, and in terms of metrics, what are some of the key metrics and uh, data points when we're talking about the, those things? Oh, uh, yeah, so, uh, I mean, in our case, most people come for a problem um, because, you know, there was something wrong with a product that they, that they purchased mm -hmm. or they didn't like something. Um, so we are um, not as advanced as we should be in, in terms of building communities in the social universe um, today, um, but, I, you know, my hope is that will, that will change over time. Yeah, so I think um, just to kind of sum it up, and we appreciate everyone tuning in, and we'll take some of those questions offline on Twitter, but we hope that this has been useful, and let's continue the conversation. And I know that everyone um, who was on the panel today, Michael, David, and Mark, would be willing to answer questions. And please do visit RPR. Um, you know, we have some resources here for you guys, which we'll keep up, but, you know, we're really here to, to be helpful and to help people understand um, how to communicate value and really what data matters. So, again, really appreciate everyone tuning in, and have a great day. Thanks so much. Thank you.